My guest, Stephen Brooks, had a visitation from an angel, and he was told about an ancient form of victory that few people really understand and grasp. Do you need some victory in your life? Of course you do. Welcome to the human race. Stephen, when you were a young man, you literally heard the audible voice of God. Tell me about that. I did, Sid. That was about 18 years ago when that first, those type of experiences first began to take place in my life. But I was down in Mississippi at my grandmother's house, and she was a very godly woman. Uh, at that time during uh, of the day, nobody was at the house. Um, my family, my brothers, and uh, plus my grandmother, they had all gone somewhere else up the hill to do something. And uh, I was spending time in one of the rooms of the house alone, just reading my Bible. After a while, I just laid out on the floor and was praying and kind of reading the Bible. And I heard a voice speak to me. Uh, it, it, it sounded like a male voice. It was audible. And it said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Did you know that that was in the Bible at that time? Not at that time, I didn't. About two weeks later, when I was reading through the book of James, I found it, of course, that's James chapter four, verse eight. But the, uh, those type of experiences began to propel and push me uh, to desire to want to have a deeper walk with the Lord. But what did you do with this information? I started running with it. Uh, I didn't understand really how to draw near to God, but I began to take the steps that I, the basics, you know, begin to study the Bible, read the Bible more, begin to pray, begin to wait on the Lord, and uh, by growth and grace, uh, began to make some spiritual progress. And well, well, you then, years later, you were on an extended fast and you had quite a visitation. Tell me about it. This was in the year of 2000, Sid, when I was doing a 40-day fast uh, with just water and some juice, maybe some thin apple juice or some things along that line, just to give me some energy. Uh, but I was on this fast, and on the 10th day, uh, when I was in, in the office alone, the Lord came into the office. Um, he didn't come in the, in the form of a person. He, it, uh, it appeared as a ball of light that came out from the ceiling and hovered in the corner of the room and out of that light, out of that ball of glory, the Lord spoke to me and he said, take a pen and a notepad and write one through seven. Well, I grabbed a, a pen and a notepad as fast as I could and I wrote one through seven. And he said, write these down. He said, these seven waves of blessing will come upon your life. And after I had written them all down, I looked at them and they were, it was a blueprint for the, the, the plan that God has for my life, for my personal life and also for my ministry. And now why did God show you this? I think, I'm just curious because sure. he hasn't given me a, a sheet of paper and said, these are the seven things. I'm, has he given you a sheet of paper? I wish he had. You're provoking <laughs> me to jealousy, Stephen. He did that to help me because I was really wanting to know God's will and God's plan for my life, not just to uh, try plan A or try plan B, but I really wanted to go for the gold standard. Lord, what is it you want me to accomplish in my life? I want to focus on that and really aim and go for that. So when he gave me that blueprint, those are things that I can look and it's a faith project, but I can see that the Lord wants to fulfill these things and they're coming to pass. Now, you live in a very unusual place in North Carolina. It's called Moravian Falls. And I hear so many reports of angels around there. Tell me yes. about the area. It's, it is a land of angels. It's a tremendously anointed place. Uh, uh, I live on a mountain that's known for angelic type experiences that people have, and that, but that whole area is saturated. I'm not exactly sure why. I think a lot of it has to do with all the prayer that the Moravian missionaries uh, just imparted into that area. But it's also a, a people that, uh, that just love the Lord and love the deeper things of the Lord, of moving into the apostolic, the prophetic, and just love uh, the Lord completely. So it just creates that kind of an atmosphere. Okay, well, tell me, I mean, I'm fascinated on angels. That's why I love your book called Working with Angels. Uh, tell me about the time, was it five angels were uh, in a circle around you? That was one of those experiences. You know, we can't make these things happen. I wish they could happen more often, but there are times where the Lord has granted me uh, supernatural encounters, uh, either with the Lord or with angels. And the time that happened was when I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and there's a sense, just like David heard that rustling in the mulberry tree, sometimes you know something's about to happen. And I woke up at 3 a.m. in the morning, I saw the clock, and I knew something was about to happen in the realm of the spirit, some type of visitation. But you know, honestly, said I was tired. It's still three in the morning, and we still live in a physical body, and I was tired. And so after staying up and praying for about, uh, till about, for about 15 minutes, I just laid down for a little bit, leaned back on the bed. But at 3.30, I sat straight up. I was totally awake. I, uh, I saw the clock, it said 3.30, I looked straight in front of me and there 
at the foot of the bed in a semicircle were five angels standing there and they were all looking at me smiling. Uh, how did they look? They looked, they looked glorious. They looked, they looked, uh, with, they looked as, if, as if they had absolutely no, in, no imperfections at all. Uh, just beautiful creatures. They all smiled at me and said, we are the five angels of revival. Now, when they said that, I understood they're not the only angels of revival, but these were five angels that had stood with five men during previous revivals in church history. And at that time, also one uh, revival that was continuing uh, at that time, at that present time in the church. You told me, and this is, was uh, kind of mind blowing, mm -hmm. that the one that at that time was continuing this move of God's mm -hmm. spirit, the angel looked like the man because you knew who he was. He did. He, this angel uh, looked about 85% like the man that he, min that he stands with and assists in the ministry. I understand now why when Peter was in jail, and uh, he escapes through mir miraculous angelic deliverance. He comes to that house church meeting, that home prayer group meeting, knocks on the door and Rhoda answers and goes back and tells them it's Peter's here. And they say, no, it must be his angel because they can take on similarities just like the person Who they're was saying that to. Man? That was Lyndall Cooley's angel. I have never met Lyndall Cooley, but that was his angel. Uh, he was one of those five angels. So what Stephen is saying is if you, and you have an angel, if you learn how to cooperate with this angel, then you're going to see the manifestations such as revival. Is sure. that what you're really trying to accomplish with this book? That is, it's just the book inspires people to want to get closer with God. And what happens when that, there's that drawing near, then all the other things like the angelic type things can happen. It's all icing on the cake. And you know, one of the things, well actually the angels, they, they came to talk with me about- I'll tell you what, hold that thought. I wanna find out what they said. Don't go away, we'll be right back. <laughs> we'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. I, I protest, unfair, my guest, Stephen Brooks, wakes up one evening and not one, not two, not three, not four, five angels are in a circle around him. How come you get five? What is the deal? <laughs> well, I guess five I'm Jewish, should I get something extra? Well, five represents <laughs> grace, so perhaps there was that element of grace. Not that I deserve it, but they were certainly there. And, and the thing that amazes me is these, you called them, uh, they were angels that were behind men or women. They stood that, with men that ministered with them in those revivals. Why were they there? What was their purpose? Well, they came to talk with me. They said, we want to talk with you about the spirit of holiness. And that for 30 minutes, they, uh, they did most of the talking. I was allowed to ask a few questions, but for 30 minutes, they told me how important it is to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord with holiness, that we have a, that an individual has a responsibility to do their part to- it Is holiness the way you dress? Is holiness uh, an external thing? Well, well, what were they telling you? Sure, that's a good question because when they talked with me, there wasn't a trace of what we would call legalism or you can't do this or you can't do that. Uh, because in our heart, we know the Holy Spirit will lead us to do things that are pleasing to the Lord. But there is an element of doing things. There are certain things you don't want to put into your ears. There are certain things you don't want your eyes to see. You want, you want to maintain uh, purity as much as possible because that also will attract the angels. Uh, an impure thought life. Uh, the angels pick up on that in the spirit realm. They're, they are able to see what we're emanating, what's radiating out of I, us. I have to ask you a question. Okay. What happens someone watches TV uh, that's very violent? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about something like that or are we talking about yes. something the, far Those deeper? types of things bring, uh, bring a type of spiritual defilement and a person may think that doesn't affect me. But uh, in the spirit realm, that, those things are very e easily distinguished. Uh, angels can tell what a person is emanating. If you're emanating the love of God and, and, that, and that purity, that they want to be around you. But if a person puts all kinds of garbage and filth uh, inside of their mind, inside of their thinking, uh, evil spirits, they're able to tell what a person is emanating and they, they will be attracted to that. Impure thoughts, they, they will gather around that. Thoughts of uh, self-centeredness or, or depression, that, that draws them. So there's ways that we need to live that are holy and pleasing to the Lord, to please the Lord and to create an atmosphere that's conducive to the Holy Spirit. What else did they do or tell you? It was interesting. I, I was looking at one of the angels and he, uh, I don't know the man that he stood with and served uh, during the revival that he ministered in, but it, 
That angel appeared to me to be one of the most humble beings I'd ever seen in my life. So I knew that the angel, that, uh, the man that he stood with must have been extremely humble. So I asked that angel, I said, what was it like to have been in a uh, full-blown move of God's Spirit during the revival that you ministered in? And he said, he said, really, we didn't have much to do with it. He said, we just gave all the glory to God. He carried the whole thing. And that angel just deflected everything right back on the Lord. And I, I knew that the man that he had helped stand with in ministry must have been an extremely humble man. Kind of reminds me what it said about Moses in the book of Numbers, that he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And so there's somebody today that actually is the most humble person on the face of the earth. And so there, there are categories that God ranks and there are things that we can move into. There's a race that's going on to be closest to the Lord, to be humble. A and man so, looks at someone on television, someone that has a meeting with 10,000, 100,000 people in attendance, right. but I think God's measurement is different than man's. It can be completely different the way the Lord measures success. And it's really being obedient to the Lord and doing what He told you to do, whatever that might be. That's where the reward is at. That's where the anointing is at. Oh, you gotta tell me about you, you experienced what revival was like. Tell me that. Right, at, uh, right after the end, before they left, they, they asked me a question. They said, would you like to experience what it's like to be under that power of the Holy Spirit in a full-blown move of God's Spirit? A Holy Ghost revival is what they called it. They actually used that old, what we would consider an old-fashioned term. I said, yes. I said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't a time to go back to bed. But Sid, when I did that, uh, each one of those angels reached out with his right hand and extended his uh, index pointing finger, and they touched me with the very tip of their finger, just very gently. And I fell out for two hours. Uh, when you uh, say you fell uh, out, what I do you shot. Uh, it was like electric. It, it's like I got hooked up to some kind of electrical current, and it just went all through my body. I lost all strength. I fell off the bed, and uh, I was. Did you I hurt was, yourself? No, there. I wasn't bruised or anything, but I was shaking, uh, tremendous shaking for two hours. And you know what? My mind is still working the whole time this is going on, and I'm thinking I'm going to wake up my wife. I'm going to wake <laughs> up my daughter in the next room because I had left the room to go to a separate room to pray. And, uh, but it's one of those things you just yield to. It's, it's the Lord doing a work. And uh, you know, the early, uh, uh, in the, the early American history, the Shakers and Quakers, that's how they got those names, the Spirit of God just doing a shaking. And but what was uh, God literally, maybe you don't know, but what was God doing in you? That's a good question. He's doing a, deep, a deeper work. He was shaking more of Stephen Brooks out so there could be more of God to fill me up. And uh, it's just a deeper surrender to the Lord. It's a deeper letting go. It's a, it's a deeper saying, I'll do anything. And I, and I really mean it as much as I can possibly and sincerely express that. That's what it is, just making more room for Him. Now, did these angels tell you uh, what's coming next as far as revival or no? That's one of the things uh, uh, on that 40 day fast, the Lord talked with me also on that 10th day when He came to me. Those angels, particularly at that time, those five angels, they didn't speak to me. But the Lord did talk to me about the next coming healing revival, which is going to be an awesome move of God's Spirit that um, it's already beginning slightly to break upon the church. And so I, I'm one of the people, I'm not really waiting until it breaks to start moving in it. I've already been praying and, uh, and God's been doing incredible Listen, miracles. Listen, you healing. told me some of the miracles uh, that are going to happen in this next move of God's Spirit. And Stephen Brooks is beginning to have a foretaste of this. Don't go away. We'll be back in just one moment. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Stephen Brooks, and Stephen had a visitation from Jesus, and Jesus described to him the next, the greatest move of God's Spirit in history for healing and miracles that's about ready to happen. Stephen, what did he tell you? Well, the interesting thing, Sid, that is that the Lord said, I want to talk with you about the coming healing revival. And I was, I was very interested in that. And so he began to share some things with me. And one of the things I want to share is that it's America's turn. 
and God has provoked. I hear so much bad stuff about America. It's good to hear some good about America. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah, there's some great things coming. And, and, you know, the Lord has provoked the American church to jealousy. We've heard about the great miracles, even the creative miracles in South America and Africa and uh, different parts of the world. But we haven't, we've only seen little tidbits of that here in America. But that is coming to America. These great creative miracles are coming to America. And the healing revival is going to hit a level that will surpass anything that's ever happened in church history. It's going to be very powerful. Give me some specifics, he told you, of the types of healings. The Lord gave me several uh, specific examples. He said one thing that will happen in these meetings, he said the meetings will run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He said they'll run around the clock. It'll just it'll be a total outpouring of his spirit. He said one thing that will take place is that people that have, that have suffered severe burns, even third degree burns, uh, which can even be fatal. He said they'll be brought into the meeting and laid out in the meeting. He said they'll be completely healed and receive brand new skin. I, I can picture this going on in Israel with all the terrorism that goes on there. And I can picture people that know God, not religion, not tradition, but no God going into the hospitals and the burn mm. units. Can you picture that, Stephen? Absolutely. It happened to Naaman, the Syrian army general. He received brand new skin. It said his skin was like that of a young child. Uh, and so we're going to see these types of creative miracles that will just, uh, uh, it won't boggle our faith, but it will boggle the imagination of many people. What did he tell you about brain damage? He told me even uh, children uh, that have Down syndrome or, or, or people that have suffered mental retardation, they'll come into the meetings. He said they will sit, the Lord told me this. He said they will sit under that glory and sit in that glory that will be in those meetings. And in, in two weeks, he said they'll be completely healed. Their mind will be completely restored to them. Completely now, you've had a foretaste of this. Tell me about the person you prayed for. We've, I've prayed for several people that the Lord has touched uh, uh, children that have suffered Down syndrome. And the Lord just caused their mind to snap. It, it, it affected their physical bodies. Their, the mothers told me that a miracle has taken place and their children have been healed. And so we're already touching on this, pushing into these realms that the Lord just wants to explode upon the American church. Now, you have a deal with keys. And God used lost keys to tell you of an ancient form of victory that most people are not even, don't, are clueless about. Explain. Sid, I had two experiences take place in my life that for a couple of years were very perplexing, very puzzling, and that I lost, uh, and twice I lost uh, my set of keys. I, I never lose keys, but one time when I, uh, before the Lord put me full time into the ministry years back, I was on the plumbing field. I lost my keys and I found them in a most unusual way that I talk about in the book on working with angels. Uh, several years went by, actually quite a few years went by, uh, but uh, I was in Moravian Falls and I was helping a friend with the project and I lost my keys again and found them in a most unusual way that I talk about in the book. Well, I went to do a meeting, a revival meeting up in Northern Virginia. I was there for five days. On the last day of that meeting, I was in a hotel room alone. I had one more meeting to do that night. I was praying, praying in the afternoon, getting ready for that night service. My wife and daughter had gone into town to do a few things. I had the hotel room all to myself. I was just praying and waiting on the Lord when suddenly somebody came into the room. The, the whole atmosphere uh, of the room changed. And he told me, I heard a, it was a male voice and it, he, this, this being spoke to me and said, that's why you were allowed to have found lost keys because praise is the lost key to victory. Tell me about that woman with the broken bones that prays to victory. That was a great miracle that happened in one of our conferences that, conferences that we hosted just recently. This lady flew all the way out from California. She believed that she got to the meeting. God will do a, a miracle in her foot. Her foot had five broken bones that the doctor had examined, had x-rayed and, and showed the bones. And she came out to this meeting and believed that God would do a miracle in her foot. And uh, she came on her crutches and everything. But she brought a pair of tennis shoes to wear back. She came in faith. She knew God was going to do it. I prayed for her that afternoon on the last day of the meeting. And uh, this was late in the afternoon. That night we had one more session. And on that last praise and worship song of that meeting, guess who came dancing down in, uh, the aisle in front of hundreds of people with a brand new healed foot? You know, she went back to the doctor. The doctor re-examined her foot in California and said, you know, now that we've re-examined your foot, you actually broke seven bones. But he said, I, and he held up the x-ray to her and said, I have never seen such phenomenal new bone growth development. And on the x-ray, it shows white streaks that just shot out 
well, the new bones just instantly grew back out. She was completely healed. And, and you, you know what just mm -hmm. blows me away is one day Stephen was praying and all of a sudden he felt as if someone was in the back seat of his car. He was there alone just praying. Uh, did you feel the weight, the, like the car going down a little bit? When I went into this experience, I actually felt the weight of the car go down and I knew that somebody had come and sat in the back seat of the car. And I said, Lord, I said, somebody just came and sat in the back seat of the car. He said, yes, they did. He, sa he said, two angels have come. I said, what are they here for? He said, they're here to help you in your times of prayer and fasting. I said, what are their names? He said, their names are Joash and Josiah. And when, the Lord, when I heard this voice, the Lord speaking to me, I turned around and I looked in the back seat of the car and there sitting there were two angels, the most beautiful beings I'd ever seen in my life. Stephen, you're provoking everyone to jealousy. I believe if Stephen prays for you, you will be more sensitive to the spirit realm than you ever have before. Stephen, would you pray? Father God, I pray for those that are watching this program today all around the world. Father, I thank you that you've given your angels to assist and aid and help your people. They're ministers of salvation. Now, Father, I pray for a greater angelic awareness of the spirit realm and of the angels than ever before for your people. I pray for a heightened sense of, a, of awareness and alertness, Father, and I thank you for increased angelic activity and breakthroughs and deliverance in the lives of your people. Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you remember that Stephen heard an audible voice? If you will draw close to me, I will draw close to you. That's been the whole purpose that God orchestrated that you watch this show, so that you will take a baby step towards God. And he says this to you, I promise you, I'm not a man that I should lie. I promise you, that I will draw close to you. The very first step is to make him your Messiah and Lord. Wherever you're at, this is your first step of drawing close to God. And if you will pray a prayer, something like this, dear God, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life for which I'm sorry. I believe that Yeshua, that's Hebrew for Jesus, or say Jesus, I believe that Jesus took all of my mistakes called sins on him. And by his blood, my sins were not just covered, they were washed away. And now I can have intimacy with you, God. You've always loved me, but you haven't been able to live inside of me. And I haven't been able to experience all of the love that you have for me and I'm ready to experience. I've experienced the world. I'm about ready to experience you, God. I've tried everything else. I'm, I want you. This is my way of drawing close to you. Now, you use your own words. You don't want to use my words, but you, you got the drift of what I'm saying. And I promise you that if you'll make Jesus your Messiah and Lord as best you can, that's your way of drawing closer to God. And as you take those baby steps, your father, and he's a perfect heavenly father, is going to come running to you. He's going to put his arm around you. He's going to address you in royalty because you are his child. He's going to give you real shalom, real peace. That's what you want. Peace is in Jesus.